G'day everyone, Dicko here with the start of yet another brand new kick-ass walkthrough series. This time it's gonna be all about rendering, or more precisely how you get from a boring, plain, old, grey scene and create something truly beautiful out of it. So what will we cover? Let's see, we're gonna start with the setting up of a scene then move on to how the material node editor works, followed by some texturing fundamentals, and then we're gonna wrap it up with a crash course on rendering and compositing. The plan is to keep these videos digestible and cover the broad strokes, to give you enough information on things that you can adapt what I talk about in these videos to almost anything in the future, or at least provide the framework to let you dive deeper into these systems if you want to. So, what are we gonna make? Well. We're gonna try and create a somewhat realistic still life scene, complete with wine, cheese, grapes, and all the other kinds of fancy crap that you might have on a still life image. So strap in and take a deep dive into making some truly gorgeous renders. Now, we have one big barrier to this whole thing. We have no fruit, we have no vegetables, no cheese or wine to speak of. Well, fear not my astute creator, you will have access to the whole cornucopia on my brand new Patreon page. That's right, the time has finally come. Due to popular demand, you can now access ad-free video content, project files, and more by subscribing to my Patreon. It's early days yet, and there's only one tier to speak of at this time, but if you just wanna help support the channel and the creation of more videos such as this, feel free to subscribe to the Patreon. And of course, if you are not keen on Patreon or anything like that, that's okay, I don't mind. A simple like on this video is more than enough um, for me as well. And I appreciate the continued support from my viewers. So with that being said, let's jump right into this video and get started. All right, so let's see what we got here. And as you can see, what we have is apparently an empty scene file well that's not quite true we have a bunch of crap in this file for you to play with um so mainly fruit so um we have some plums where's my plums there they are over here tiny little plums we got some plums we got some oranges avocados apples pears bananas Wine bottles, pumpkins, plates, tables, to your heart's content. And we also got a little bit of fabric of different kinds. We got a cheese board, some cheese, obviously, some grapes, and that's about it. And of course, a grand plane, but you don't really need that for this file. Um, there's some basic lights in here as well, but we're not going to use those for our file for the next stage of this uh, demonstration. And that is how to set up a scene file with this as a reference. All right, now that you have that file ready to go, we are not going to actually open it up directly, but we're going to use it as a proxy. So what you'll need to do is to make a brand new Blender file, delete everything in it, or move whatever you need or want to keep into another collection. And then we're going to actually link in different collections from the original file. So to do that, go to file, press link, and then navigate to the project file where the fruit and table and all that sort of crap lies in. Um, I think that's called assets 001 at this time. Um, navigate to the collections folder and then import or import all the collections that you want to bring into the file. So I would suggest basically bring in everything except for maybe the backup folder and stuff like that. So the fruit, the table, the cloth, everything, just bring them all in as collections and then press okay when you're ready to move to the next step. All right, so once you've done that, you'll see everything pop into the scene and they're all organized by the collection that the, um, the original file was set up in. But we have one issue. The collections that we've imported are almost treated as if they are single objects in of themselves, rather than being containers for multiple objects as they are in the original file. So what we need to do is actually create library overrides 
to be able to edit the individual objects that sit within those original collections. Now, this isn't necessary for every collection, especially if you have a collection where um, there's only a single object that sits within it. But for say the fruit that have multiple objects within those collections, you may want to create a library override. All right, so creating a library override is pretty simple. Select the collection that you wanna create the override for, go down to object, relations, and then click on library override. And that will reset the transforms of that particular collection or the objects within that collection back to the zero transform location it was in the original file. But now you can select the individual objects of that collection and move them as you see fit. Put them wherever you like, place them wherever you like, it's good to go. So go ahead and do that with any collection that you think you want to use. You don't have to use every single element of this asset pack, you can use whatever you like. Um, whatever you think is more fun, interesting, whatever composition you want to do, go for it. Um, so it just takes a few moments to go ahead and, you know, link up or override all those collections. Unfortunately, you can't make overrides on a multiple selection. You have to do it individually on individual collections. So it does take a little bit of time to do. It gets a bit annoying. But you can see here now I can manipulate those apples, for instance, um, as individual elements within a collection. So um, yeah, just go ahead and do that for the rest of the collections that you want to use. So you might be wondering, why the hell aren't we just using the original file? Well, there's a bunch of reasons to be honest, but the most direct reason I can give you is that by having the file referenced into a new scene file, it allows us to do edits in that original file, which will then populate to this new scene file. So for example, if we go ahead and need to uh, UV unwrap the fruit, for instance. Um, it's a lot easier to do that when all the fruit is at the center of the world, there's no rotations, no transforms, and you aren't going to be obstructed by all the other crap in the scene. Um, and then once you do that, it will populate to this new scene and um, everything will be hunky-dory, which is great. The other advantage is usability and flexibility. So when I refer to usability, I mean that if you go ahead and do all your UV unwrapping, your texturing, your materials in that original asset file, you are essentially creating an asset library, which can then be reused in other scenes. So for instance, if you plan on using these fruit for something else completely different, like a, a short film, another shot, or something else in particular, you will already have a nice clean asset library file for you to reference in those assets in the future. And finally, the other major advantage here is that if you are going to be rendering out multiple files with multiple scenes that are laid out completely different, if you decide to change an asset, say change a texture or change a material or even change geometry, by having the original asset file and you edit those objects in that asset file, and save that file, it will populate that change to every other scene file that those objects are featured within. That will save you so much time when it comes to replacing assets, fixing assets, and overall improving your scene. So it's a lot more adaptable in that regard. And while that might not be obvious right now as we work through things, it will become obvious why the advantages are there as we start to work on materials, textures, and other things such as that. So just be patient and you'll start to see it all make sense in the future. So as you start to add all these different assets and move them around, you may find yourself getting a little bit overwhelmed by the fact that everything's just gray. So what I would actually suggest is change the viewport overlay from just the standard shader to random in the upper viewport settings there. By going to random color, it just makes it a lot easier to discern what object is what, where they are, and it just, I think it's just more fun to use as well. So that's just a little uh, tip I like to give. I think it's a great little feature within Blender. It's quite unique within the software as well. All right, so once you've got everything imported and overridden and you're good to go, the first major thing you wanna do is get a camera in your scene. And whether you have one or not already, pretty simple, just create a camera or use the one that you already have in the scene and line it up in a way that is compositionally or aesthetically pleasing to you. Now, you know, I'm not gonna give you any fast or hard rules about what kind of composition to go for. All I would say is either look at reference, so look up some still life paintings online or whatever, or, you know, 
use the go-to compositional um, paradigms like rule of thirds, golden rule, all that sort of shit. And now the next thing I want you to do is go straight to the camera settings and go to the viewport display and crank up the opacity on the Passaparto. Passaparto. Um, the reason being <laughs> is it allows you to see exactly what is visible in your camera's view, not just the viewport itself. So this will avoid any compositional mistakes on your part where you think something is in frame when in actuality it isn't. This is something that I learned when I was studying animation and my mentor gave this information probably in the first week and I thought it's one of the most important things that I was taught um, straight off the bat. It's so useful to have that turned on. I don't know why it's not on in default, but that's just something I like to have with whatever I do. Animation, rendering, compositional stuff. It just helps with figuring out your composition. And now with that camera set up, you've chosen a, co a camera composition. It's now time for the fun stuff, and that is placing the crap around the scene. Now you can use whatever you like. You don't have to use every element. So for instance here, I'm only gonna use maybe one or two pieces of the cloth here rather than all three. I'm obviously gonna be using the table. And now I'm just gonna go ahead and start positioning things in a way that I think is appealing. I'm not gonna show you the whole process here. It's pretty damn straightforward. Just move plate things into place, make it interesting, um, make it appealing for you and um, set it up in a way that, you know, when you render it, you'll be happy with it. Pretty straightforward. Now, if you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed with the amount of objects that you're gonna be dealing with, don't worry. My suggestion is to start with the larger elements and the base elements. So when I say base elements, I mean things like the plate or the cheese board or elements that the other objects will either sit on or be placed on top of. Then work in your larger elements. So stuff like the bottles and the, um, the pumpkins, if you're gonna be using them. And that will allow you to figure out where your points of interest will lie. And then worry about the small elements like the bananas, the apples, the uh, peach, peaches, the plums, etc. By doing that, you're figuring out uh, where things should go from a, I guess, a hierarchical sense. And the other cool thing about doing this is that you're naturally creating, I guess you can say, a step-like composition in detail. Now, you may be seeing me doing something kind of interesting here. And one of the cool things with library overrides is that you can actually add modifiers to them. So for instance, with those grapes, I use a lattice modifier to have it sort of bend over the edge of the table. So don't forget, you can actually still use modifiers with library overrides. And that's what makes it so powerful versus say the traditional, at least the blender traditional proxy system. All right, so once you've done the uh, placing of all your objects and you're happy with it, it's now time to worry about at least blocking out the lighting. And uh, we're going to be using cycles for this project because um, whilst EV is great, I want to try and get the best kind of render possible out of this file. So uh, I want to get realistic lighting, realistic reflections, that sort of stuff going on. And that's only something you can get from cycles. All right, so as you can see here, we have no lights in our scene at this moment, but also the scene itself already is getting some ambient light from the world material. So the world setting has actually got a dark gray. We need to change that. And then we actually have to add lights as well. So I've got some lights in a collection ready to go, some very basic lighting. But first I'm going to darken out the world, make it pitch black because I want to rely on the lights to convey contrast. I don't wanna have any ambient light at the moment to work with. So I'm just gonna work with a very basic three point light setup to start with. They're all gonna be area lights and I'm just gonna place them in a way that gives me shadow contrast, highlight contrast, and some decent midtones in certain areas. So areas to be aware of is probably contrast in the fabric, the way the ripples are. Um, you wanna catch some highlights on the fruit and the bottle, so try and catch highlights in certain areas. But also, if you wanna go for an, a real studio style lighting, feel free to try and get some sort of rim light going on. 
Uh, for those who don't know what rim light stands for, it's basically a sliver of light on the opposite side of your main highlight that sort of catches the light behind the objects and gives um, a little bit of structure to that scene. That being said, it's also become a little bit of a meme within the sort of VFX look dev circles within the CG world. But the only reason that's the case is because it looks so damn nice. So feel free to give it a go. Again, compositionally, feel free to look at some references online, namely, most likely, three point light setup will do for now. And the nice thing about 3D is that we can always change it down the line. So just try and get enough contrast in your scene to give it a nice mood. And again, look at your um, references in terms of still life paintings, uh, well, well made ones, of course. Um, look at some classical paintings in that regard and you'll be able to find some really strong examples out there. Within Blender, of course, be sure to check out the um, the light radius, you can always change that to adjust the um, the sharpness or the softness of that light source. Um, be sure to experiment with the wattage, that is the intensity of that light, and also the position. So experimentation goes a long way in this regard. So there's no right or wrong answer when it comes to these sort of things. It's really down to personal taste, and it's also down to um, what you find appealing. So again, be experimental. I'm not going to give any fast and hard rules in this regard. So have fun with it. Another recommendation I would give you at this time is do not be tempted to add color to the scene just yet. Don't go into uh, any of these fruits and override the materials or add a material to this thing to um, give it color. It's only going to be distracting. It's only going to be annoying. Um, you're better off working with these plain gray materials at this time to establish the lighting structure of your scene and then we'll worry about the materials in the next video. All right, so this is what I created for my particular composition. I've added a second bottle. I've added a little bit of... Um, I've tried to add some points of interest, so the grapes, the bottle, the pumpkin at different levels and at different depths. Um, and I've also added a quick, simple flat plane on the background with the same material, just to see how the light is sort of going to be reflecting on the background. Apart from that, that's all we need to do for now. And in the next video, we are going to talk about how to make some semi-procedural materials for the fabric. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. So expect some silky, smooth velvet in the next video. Until then, all I'm going to say is catches and have fun. Cheers.